So today we're going to be discussing sound. Now just simply paying attention to your sound and giving it some love and care is probably our first battle. For whatever reason, it seems to be something a lot of people avoid and don't invest much time in. But then of course we will go on to discuss how to improve the sound and how to develop it. I actually think that the sound we make is probably the single most personal thing about our playing. So if we just think about that for a second, much like how your voice sounds or how your nose looks or your mouth looks, the tone you produce on your instrument is entirely unique. Now I think sometimes when we're searching to improve something that's so personal, we end up asking ourselves some questions that can be a little bit uncomfortable, or at least they should be a little bit uncomfortable. Because actually a question like, what do I want to sound like, is not all that far away from a question like, what sort of person do I want to be, or who do I want to be, or actually who am I? So I could imagine that for some of you, it's possible that the answer to that kind of question is, I would like to sound like this violinist or that violinist. Maybe it's Hilary Hahn or Ray Chen or Yehudi Menuhin. And of course, it's great to be inspired by other people, those that are the best at what they do. They inspire us. They lift us up. But if you immediately look to somebody else's sound as your inspiration, then I think we sort of need to readdress the question itself, because whether you actually like it or not, you're only ever going to be one person. Of course, that person is you and your sound is only ever going to be your sound. So as much as we want to look outside of ourselves and get inspiration, we also equally have to address a level of acceptance both about ourselves and the sound that we make and we have to kind of work on developing it and deepening it from that perspective. So we're just going to go through all the various things that have to be taken into account when producing sound and developing your sound. Of course bow hold is paramount. Bow placement. Is it going to be down here, up here, 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 here? Bow angle. Do you want the bow shooting off that way or coming that way? Bow speed. Do you want to be using a fast bow? Do you want to be using a very slow control bow? Bow pressure. Do you want to be sinking into the string for a nice big fat sound? Or do you want to be hovering over the string and just creating lots of air and lightness? So I'd like to show you now some examples of just how extreme and how contrasting different people's sounds can be. You may think that that's sort of a purely physical thing, that everyone is just different shapes and sizes and has different style techniques. The strongest force at play when developing your sound is actually your hearing, but also your intention and your desire. How do you want to sound? Your ears are powerful instruments in themselves. Once you engage them, once you switch them on, they will guide you.
So I'd just like to share a little anecdote with you that was a real standout moment for me in terms of developing my sound. I was studying with the wonderful violin teacher Maciek Rakowski. So just, just more casual. Yeah. Then it... on Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. Now there's one place where you're playing on the E string, it's finally you're not playing a million notes at once and racing up and down the instrument but you're just playing melodic material that kind of blossoms and it's very comfortable and it's a very satisfying moment and Maciek just was relentless in getting me to use my ears as the guide but also my brain in taking into consideration all of the various things that go into producing sound and basically experimenting for as long as I could stand. Obviously I'm using Tchaikovsky Concerto as an example but this can be applied to any piece you're working on. So when I talk about experimenting, what do I really mean? Taking all of those different components and pushing them to their limits and then kind of backing off from them as much as possible. So if we take one of those examples, it would be bow pressure. I actually like to use the term bow weight more than pressure because pressure implies that, again, you're gripping hold of the bow, which as you'll all know, I do not advocate for that. But the weight is kind of sinking as much of your arm weight into the string as possible. So I'm just going to show some examples of using way too much pressure and then I'm going to back right off and use too little pressure. I'm just going to try to show you how it looks trying to kind of experiment with those outer dimensions. So what I'm doing when I do that is trying to feel the resonance of the instrument. So it's almost like if you're trying to get your friend to agree with you on something because you really believe in it, you're not going to do it by screaming at your friend and saying you have to agree with me. You're going to probably be a little bit more successful through explaining and being sensitive to what they think but being sure in what you think and kind of finding a meeting gr ground between the two of you. That's how it feels when I'm trying to, I'm trying to feel the vibration of the instrument. And then when I feel that it's really resonating as best as possible, then I can start just trying to apply a little bit more pressure. So I'm listening really, really carefully and just feeling the instrument. Sometimes a little bit less vibrato so you can feel the resonance. Now I'm going to go way over the top and use far too much pressure. So pressure, weight, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to basically go too far so the sound starts to strangle and squeeze. The reason you're doing that is you're, is you're actually kind of challenging the instrument and you're also challenging your hands into trying to work out what is the furthest I can go. You have to know what the extremes are in order to know where you sit in the middle to make the most beautiful but projecting sound.
So now I'm going to show you going from one extreme to the other and then finding my middle ground. The moral of this story is to experiment with your sound, don't shortchange your sound, appreciate how important it is and reserve some of your practice into developing it. So despite obviously believing that making your sound better is more of an internal and personal experimentation, there are nevertheless some exercises that can be incredibly useful. Now, I haven't gone into bow changes. I mean, we could spend weeks and weeks on that and we will, don't worry. <laughs> Nor have I gone into bow distribution or string crossing, but I thought I'd just share with you a few exercises that are hopefully useful for kind of more of the basics of comfort and sound production. So this is the very brave and lovely Annabelle who is a student of my friend Laura Gardner and she's jumping straight into demonstrating probably the single most horrible exercise of all time. I also believe she's trying it for the very first time right now. <laughs> the gist of the exercise is that you're trying to use as slow a bow as humanly possible. So actually this is more like a meditation than it is an actual bowing exercise. You need to be in complete control of your breath. You need Need to have extreme patience, you need concentration and you also need to be able to time yourself to see if you're improving so get a stopwatch. So this exercise is using the good old Kreutzer number two. I played this exercise endlessly at Yehudi Menu in school with Natasha Boyarski and also when I studied with Maciek Rakowski after that. It's an exercise that is endlessly useful and can be used for all kinds of different things. But in this particular one, we're using it for freedom in the middle of the bow. So the point of this exercise is to be absolutely avoiding the outer extremes of the bow. So don't go to the tip and don't go to the heel and just stay in the middle and get comfortable so be bold and free don't play too slowly or too carefully get all the parts of your right hand flowing and just everything nice and comfortable so this one is definitely more annoying than the other one we're right at the very tip of the bow and we want to kind of utilize and waken up the fingers as much as possible so the actual pads of your fingers are really they've got a good grip and a good feel of the bow so we're not hovering above the bow too much you also want the bow itself on the string to feel really sticky kind of like you're spreading butter onto bread and i know that's really difficult to do because we're so far away from the string with your right hand fingers but you have to use your imagination and just engage your right hand as much as possible. So this is definitely the most annoying one of all. I don't know about all of you but I have struggled with bow changes especially at the heel throughout my violin playing life and I have been taught and experimented with literally hundreds of different ideas and techniques. So this exercise definitely tackles this as it depends on you having a lot of control at the heel. But for now, I just want you sort of experimenting with not having a locked and stiff and rigid right hand. So if you go back and look at all of the examples of bow holds in last week's video, and then look at all the different violinists we looked at this week, you'll see that there is no right way to change the bow at the heel. So some people have kind of like a little click 
Some other people have a flick where they speed up the bow slightly just before changing. Some people are extremely zen and actually slow down before they change the bow. And some people's are just so naturally smooth you don't even notice. Anyway, we will get into all of that in more detail in future videos. But for now, I just want you to try to see what your hand wants to do and where it seems to produce the best sound. Now I'm aware that a lot of us will actually be playing most of the time in groups rather than on your own. So for this, I would say that you have to be even more flexible and adaptable. And that relies most heavily on your ability to listen to others more than you're listening to yourself. To be extremely sensitive and to be aware of everything that surrounds you and to play inside of that sound. You're listening to the sound and yes, you're playing, but you're trying to play inside of everybody else's sound. Just focusing on that and concentrating on doing it will waken up your ears in a different kind of way and will guide your hands to do the right thing. So I hope you found that video helpful. Let me know if you have any questions, if you maybe have some of your own advice that you'd like to add to this topic and general feedback. Thank you. <laughs>